morning, city. Thank you. I'm a little, you know, excited this morning. Good morning, CR family. CR is a family, I'm gonna tell you that. And I have to give a shout out to Amber and Adam who might be watching online. They were two of our very favorite people who moved to Wyoming, and I think they're watching. I am a grateful believer in Jesus Christ who struggles with codependency and food issues. My name is Lynn. Amen. They know how to answer that. They accuse me of having another addiction as well, which is? Hugs, Hugs. yep and they feed that well. This is how we introduce ourselves in CR because our identity is not our worst struggle. Our identity is in Christ. So we make that clear every time we introduce ourselves at CR. Today we celebrate two years of our CR ministry here at City Park Church. It has been and continues to be an incredible journey. When Luke Hermson preached a few weeks ago, he made a reference to a resurrected life being one of God's trophies. I love that, it stuck with me. So today I present to you a big trophy case full of God's victories in many lives right up here. One thing we do at Celebrate Recovery is praise God in song and prayer, just like church. Another thing we do is read together the eight principles or the 12 steps along with their biblical comparisons. In a moment, we're going to have you join us to do that this morning. Then you are going to hear from four of our members of how these victories have come about in their lives. We want you to see and hear a little bit about what Celebrate Recovery Meeting is like. And after the service, we encourage you to join us for a great potluck up in Schaefer Hall. I need to thank Carol and Wade Pacheco for taking that off my shoulders this week. And thank you so much. And whoever else they recruited to help with that as well. Thank you very much. Um, Watch for anyone wearing one of these, and you'll know who we are. Welcome them this morning. They are all like family to me. We pray that the words of my four friends this morning about what God has accomplished in their lives will be an encouragement, an inspiration, and a blessing to you this morning. Todd. He's going to lead the reading of our eight principles. Well, good morning again, City Park Church. I am a faithful follower and recently baptized <laughs> member of City Park Church and follower of Jesus Christ. I suffer from a plethora of hurts, habits, and hang-ups, and my name is Todd. Hi, Todd. So if you'll read along with me, hopefully they'll be up on the jumbotrons, and if not, I'll just read them really loud, and those of you that have them can read along with me. There they are. Realize that I am not God. I admit that I am powerless to control my tendency to do the wrong thing and that my life is unmanageable. Happy are those who know they are spiritually poor. Matthew 5, 3. Earnestly believe that God exists and that I matter to him and that he has the power to help me recover. Happy are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Matthew 5, 4. Consciously choose to commit all my life and will to Christ's care and control. Happy are the meek, Matthew 5, 5. Openly examine and confess my faults to myself, to God, and to someone I trust. Happy are the pure in heart, Matthew 5, 8. Voluntarily submit to every change God wants to make in my life and humbly ask him to remove my character defects. Happy are those whose greatest desire is to do what God requires. Matthew 5, 6. Evaluate all my relationships, offer forgiveness to those who have hurt me, and make amends for harm I've done to others, except when to do so would harm them or others. Happy are the merciful. Matthew 5, 7. Happy are the peacemakers. Matthew 5, 9. Reserve a daily time with God for self-examination Bible reading and prayer in order to know God and his will for my life and to gain the power to follow his will. Yield myself to God to be used to bring the good news to others, both by my example and by my words. Happier those who are persecuted, 
because they do what God requires. Matthew 5.10. Thank you. Yeah, this, is, this usually doesn't happen, but Lynn is making me take my hat off. So if I blind anybody with my shiny head, blame Lynn. <laughs> I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ. And like Todd, I suffer from a lot of hurts, hang hangups, and habits. And my name's Chris. So, I'm sorry. Um, before, before my life in Jesus Christ, I was a lost soul with nothing but despair and death without salvation. In the first 10 years of my life, I thought I had an exceptionally good. My family, my family lived in a big home in a good community where I was one of the only black kids around. It was, it was my normal even though there were lots of dysfunctionalism. Although we went to church every Saturday, my home life was nothing to write home about. Yes, we followed the original Sabbath, and yes, things seemed good from an outsider's perspective. However, it was, ripe with, it was ripe with arguing, abuse, and loss of love throughout our home. I was always disciplined harshly, rather harshly, never knowing how my father would react to getting into any type of trouble. When spending the night at another church member's home, there was always a note to discipline me as they wished, as they wished I were, if I were to get in trouble. Although I was a good student, respectful, and even timid, the harshness of punishments went well past the usual disciplinary actions. When I was 10 years old, I clogged up the toilet and my father made me take it out with my bare hands. However, that was not the worst punishment of, all, of them all. When I was seven, I got into a fight at summer camp. My father beat me so badly, I laid on the floor, naked and severely bruised. I remember my mom yelling at me, at my dad, saying, he's just a kid, and hearing her slapping him. My mother told me to never mention this, or, or dad would go to jail. So I did not. She covered up my bruises with long sleeve shirts and pants, even though it was the middle of summer. I did not understand then but I did, I, did under, even, I did everything to do what my mother asked me to do. As I got older and my parents divorced when I was 10, my sister and my mother and I moved. However, what we were moved to was nothing like I had ever known before. There were drugs and gangs everywhere, and honestly, I was afraid. Although I had my older sister, she soon ran off and disappeared, finally turning up in Colorado some year, a year later. I remember catching her and, her and her boyfriend packing up things into the car and giving me $20 not to say anything to, to the, to the next day to my mom. I stayed, I, I stayed okay not knowing how that would soon affect my relationship with my mother for, for many years after. She would constantly blame me and for not telling her about it until the next day. I was able to get a quarter to call home one time after my mom left me at a park. When she answered, I thought it would, be, it would go differently than it did. I mean, after all, she did leave me at a park. However, she blamed me, and I had to walk the five miles home only to be spanked, and I trusted no one afterwards. As a teen, I felt lost and did not know where I fit in. I was not like all, all of my friends who have shot at people, but I was affiliated with them nonetheless, and I, had shot, I and was shot at a couple times myself. I was at an impasse, but did, not, but did not truly know Jesus. Though I was brought up in a church that discouraged interracial relationships, no birthdays, no Christmases, and did not celebrate Easter, the New Testament was no part of the equation. Nothing changed no matter how hard I worked, and my mother was not in my corner. After my sister ran off, my mother would leave me for days while out with a new boyfriend. It got so bad that while in, at a junior college, the football coach asked my mother to let me back into the home with a promise to a full scholarship because I was a good football player. However, soon after letting me back home, she continued to not allow me to eat, and when I did, it was her leftovers. I then decided to sell drugs, which I was good at, but continued, but continued even when I was, when I was accepted to a four-year college. 
When I had nowhere to live, that's why I went. So I went to a small school in Missouri. Three years later, before graduation, I had a meltdown. Kicked out of school and trying to make it, I went back to dealing drugs. That ended in 2004 when I was caught and faced and was faced with a 28-year sentence. I pled to seven and did three. Thank God for that. Fast forward to 2017, after, after a blood clot almost ended my life, I finally came to Christ while at Denver, Colorado at the crossing, which is part of the Denver Rescue Mission. It was a long road full of mistakes and, and, and mistreatment still from family. However, in 2021, after, after more homelessness and drug addiction, I went to Harvest Farm in Wellington and finally came to grips with the Holy Spirit to, for, to forgive and move on. I would like to say that things were perfect when I left Harvest Farm, but they were not. I had to still go through some missteps, but I was focusing more on Jesus Christ and not relying on myself. Life is good now, even though it was far from perfect. What I do, what I do know is how, how much the prayers of a grandmother and the blessings of God and, and even and saved my life. A life I would never have without the love of, love of Christ and God the Father. There is so much more, but what is important is who and how I came to this point. This is what I am thankful for to the Lord and Savior every day. I would like to say this in conclusion, God intended me to be here and he intended you all to be here as well. Through the struggle and even today, I realize God does not make mistakes. Everything we go through with God's help is to build character God is the architect of my story, as well as the author of it. CR has given me a place to share with others my hurts, hangups, and habits. It, was, it, has, it has been a platform for not only change, but change in, in thinking of Christ Jesus. I would like to share my life verse with you. It comes from Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you plans to give you hope in the future. Thank you very much. These are here for me. I'm prepared this time. I am a grateful believer in Jesus Christ who struggles with mental health, anger, fear, and codependency. My name is Stephanie. I was born in Georgia and raised in a Christian household with three sisters and my mom and dad. I grew up in Texas and Colorado, and it was known in our home that Jesus was Lord and we believed. We went to church on Sundays, midweek service, church activities, youth group, the works. At family reunions, we prayed and encouraged each other regularly. I don't recall many deep conversations regarding faith growing up, but I never doubted and have always believed. My parents worked hard and we were latchkey kids. Dad was a trucker, then a plumber, and mom drove school buses and worked in the schools. We went to school during the day. Downtime was spent outdoors or at friends' houses. Our curfew was the streetlights. We drank from garden hoses and we survived lack of supervision. My mom and sisters and I started spending summers on Papa's Ranch in Tennessee in my teenage years, where we would help with horses, bassets, and farm chores, and learn how to love and appreciate life in nature. I had the perfect upbringing, or so I thought. One summer day at Papa's farm, law, law enforcement arrived to serve my mom with divorce papers. It wasn't a smooth divorce, and as I was the oldest child still living at home, a lot fell on my shoulders unintentionally. My dad moved out, and we only saw him every other weekend for the next couple of years. He would eventually move away to Arizona, and our relationship was drastically reduced. My perfect life was gone, my sense of security was shaken, and I began to doubt a lot of things I had never questioned. For the first time, I felt abandoned. When I was 18, during my senior year of high school, I became pregnant. I was unwed and terrified of what that meant for my future, compli complicated more by my parents' divorce feeling so fresh. 
On April 24, 2002, I gave birth to my four, first daughter. Two weeks after she was born, I was admitted back in the hospital for eight days with three infections and a blood clot. During those eight days, her father would lose his job and disappear for three more days. Once again, I found myself feeling abandoned by a man I relied on. After I was released from the hospital, my ex and I split up to, due to differences in life perspectives. That was the first time in my life I would face the challenges of being a single mom. I moved in with my mom, who, helped me, who tried to help me navigate motherhood. I know now I was stubborn and thought I knew better. This created friction between my mom and I, who had become my best friend and anchor, and it would take us years to repair that relationship. I moved to California to marry my first husband, who was in the Navy and had been a friend for a couple of years. A few months later, my daughter moved in with us, and we started our life building a family. We had three children, a boy, then another girl born in California, then another boy born in Arkansas. Our final move as a family to Maryland in 2011 would be where tragedy would strike. December 20th of 2016, five days for Christmas, for which I was not yet prepared, I received devastating news. I received a call from a law enforcement officer telling me my oldest daughter was safe. Confused, I received a follow-up call from CPS, letting me know my daughter had revealed, revealed abuse and an investigation was started. The next few days were a blur, as it was confirmed that my husband of over 14 years was arrested and found guilty of sexual abuse of a minor, my child. He was arrested and we were safe. I was numb, broken, betrayed, confused, but mostly I was angry at God to avoid being angry at myself for failing. Over the next month, I leaned heavily on our church, my friends, and my mom especially, to pack up and clear out our 3,000 square foot home into a seven by seven foot storage unit to move back to Colorado. By the end of January, the kids and I were driving from Maryland to Colorado to start over, and I once again faced the challenges of being a single mother. One night, I remember breaking down to my mom, and she asked a vital question. Have you heard of Celebrate Recovery? We arrived in Colorado on February 1st, 2017. We moved what we could into my mom's home, where she would help us get on our feet and start over. We got the kids in school, started attending church, and I was able to get a job driving buses for PSD, all within the first week. That was God at work. Mother's Day that year was hard as I didn't feel worthy of the title. The darkness that was taking me over prompted me to attend my first CR meeting and I loved it. I felt welcomed, I felt supported, I felt free to share to a point. I was struggling with not knowing what my path was as the church and CR I was attending were my, where my mom and sister's home church was. I was taking the right steps, but what, were they the right steps for my journey? Because of those struggles, I felt disconnected on a deeper level. I saw connection with someone who truly understood just me, and instead of running to God, who was reaching out to me, I instead chose to find that my second husband. I thought he was an answer to prayer, someone who understood healing through trauma, who loved God, who was strong and could physically protect me and my children from the monster of our past, who helped recognize and indulge my triggers. COVID hit and we flourished. My isolation tendencies and codependency were free to take over. When gatherings were able to take place again, I still opted to stay to ourselves. Over the course of five years, I became disconnected from everyone around me and fully codependent on him. I didn't recover from my past. I only ran away from it. But instead of running toward God, I ran toward another man. My isolation and his narcissism would spiral during our marriage until it drove me to the point of nearly taking my life in the bathroom almost a year ago today. As I was sitting in the dark, I was sobbing to God, asking him why he made me to fail as a mom, as a wife twice, pleading with him to forgive me for what I was planning to do, hurt that this was my journey. As I sat there feeling hopeless, I clearly heard the ending to the footsteps poem. My precious, precious child, I love you and I would never leave you. 
during your times of trial and suffering, when you see only one set of footprints, it was then that I carried you. I knew his promises. I believed his promises. I trusted and leaned on his promises. So why was I questioning his plan? Why was I not crying out to him to part the seas like he did for Moses? Why was I not crying out to God in praise for showing me the abuse that I was enduring? Why was I not trusting him when he had shown me multiple times already that he was carrying me through? My whole life I knew God was there, but I had never truly run to him. I would acknowledge him, turn his way, feel his presence, but never once had I truly surrendered to him fully. Never once had I run into his open arms when he'd saved me. I wasn't hurting because he created me to. I was hurting because I was the one who chose the other path. And he chose to walk with me still, catching me as I fell time and time again. I Googled churches near me with Celebrate Recovery, and City Park Church was the first one listed. It took, so, took a few weeks for me to attend church, because I'm stubborn, and even longer to attend my first CR group here. I was automatically welcomed and was overtaken by a sense of peace and belonging. I knew I had taken the right step, and it made me excited to truly turn and run toward God. I still have so much work to do on myself, and most days I feel like I find more issues within me than resolutions. Writing this testimony, reflecting on my life and journey, I couldn't help but see how much God has worked, both out loud and behind the scenes, and how he has walked with me, patiently waiting, carrying me at times, always creating a better road ahead. He made a way each time I thought our world was over. That night in the bathroom, God renewed my perception. During the last year at CR, he's changed my name from chaos to peace, from weak to strong, from broken to healing, from devastation to joy. Through CR, I am learning that the things I struggle with, ADHD, OCD, anxiety, depression, codependency, fear, anger, they do not define who I am. They were not part of God's creation. Those are things that come from the enemy trying to sway me back. God chose me to be his daughter. And for his daughter, he has already won my battles. He's just waiting for me to catch up. It's not easy. I still struggle and fall daily because of my choices. My children now struggle with different degrees of anxiety, depression, PTSD, ADHD, and other mental health issues. However, throughout my journey and healing, God has forged me to be able to understand their struggles, to help them see how God is working through them, and it has brought us closer than I ever dared to dream I could be with my kids. I have found myself a church that I feel is my church home. I have the pleasure to work as a social worker where my struggles also help me to understand and help others. For the first time, I feel like I am truly walking God's path for me, not the one I'm creating. It's hard for me to share my journey. I feel ashamed of my failures. But even then, God is working. Many times when I share even just part of my story, I'm told my strength inspires others. I smile, send God a quick thank you, then get to share where that strength comes from. Through City Park Church and CR, I now see that sharing my story isn't simply sharing my failures and mess. It's sharing, it's sharing God's message of love, faithfulness, and healing from life's hurts, hang-ups, and habits. CR has helped me to peel back the layers of myself to find the creation God made me to be, one who is loved and welcomed and accepted. My story doesn't have a life-changing God moment. What it does have is a life filled with moments changed by God. Thank you.
Hello. I am a grateful believer in Jesus Christ who struggles with uh, a lifetime of marijuana use and alcohol. My name is Bill. Amen. Hello, everyone. So when I was asked to give my testimony, <clears throat> I was scared, I was embarrassed, and I was ashamed. But then after a time of reflection, I realized what an opportunity to show how God works and how much he loves and consistently pursues each one of us. I was adopted as an infant to a father and mother that never spoke of God, never went to church. However, I went a few times with my grandmother, mostly on Christmas and Easter. My home life was mostly chaotic. My mother ran a daycare out of our home, so there was always a lot of young children running around, which never left much time for us as a family. My father worked long hours at the Union Pacific Railroad. I never felt much connection to either one of my parents. I spent most of, uh, I spent most of my time taking care of myself, which led myself to a lot of life-changing choices. At the age of 12, I started to experience with marijuana and alcohol and hanging out with bad influences. Of course, it didn't take long before I became a bad influence. At the age of 17, I got a girl pregnant, which led to her and I dropping out of high school our sophomore year. We got married at the age of 17 and, and tried to create a family and a life together. I got a job, worked hard, and got us an apartment, and our place became the party place. So of course, it didn't work out. We got divorced after three and a half years. My relationship with my daughter from this marriage has always been a struggle due to not doing my part as a father. I'm thankful to be part of her life today. Four years later, I met a new lady. We dated for, for a year and got married. Then a year later, I had a second daughter. I felt I had another opportunity to get it right this time. The marijuana use and the party lifestyle still continued for many years, but it was hidden from most people, except for the guys, my party buddies that I was doing it with. Fast forward to 2008. I went to a men's retreat in Estes Park, and after being there for two days, a seed was planted. For the first time, I felt convicted for the way I was living my life, but, it, but I wasn't ready to surrender. I went back to my old ways soon after. Then 10 years later on my birthday, I was having some health issues. I went to the urologist and I found out that I had bladder cancer. I was absolutely devastated and I knew in this moment it was time to get right with God, but it was mostly out of desperation. This could be it, I could die. During the, four, during the next four years of treatment, God showed up and revealed a lot of things, and he loved me through my pain. In return, I slowly started moving closer to him. I believe it was time for true change in my life, time to clean up, time to be a man of God, a husband, a father, a friend. I slowly began the process of surrendering all my filthy things in my life for real this time. I became part of a ministry at Timberline Church called the Mighty Men of Valor. I was asked to be a leader. I found, I found a men's group at Genesis Project to become a part of. I became a mentor at Harvest Farm and then became part of the Celebrate Recovery Group. For the first time in my life, I was pursuing God and a godly community. My life looks much different now. Uh, I'm grateful to say my relationship with God is good and it's alive and it's healthy. I've realized that Jesus did what Jesus did for me on the cross and how much he loves me, and I'm truly thankful for that. I'm still married after 30 years. To the same lady, I'm so thankful. Sometimes I can't believe that I'm saying that.
my wife's been the only one that has stayed in my life. I'm forever grateful for her, the love and support. She's the most kind and strong, supportive, God-loving person I've ever known. I will never stop fighting to be a better husband and a spiritual leader for her. I'm so thankful to have two beautiful daughters, three grandchildren, a good, God-loving, quality, loyal friendships. Celebrate Recovery has been an instrument in my recovery. The accountability is vital to staying clean and sober. I will always be part of this ministry. If I ever move closer to my grandchildren, I will seek one out or start one up. I think about Philippians 4.13, a very famous verse that I love. I can do all things through Christ. It gives me strength daily. Also, the lyrics to the song that we heard today, which was Waymaker, Miracle Worker, Promise Keeper, Light in the Darkness, My God, that is who you are. Amen to that. I thank you so much for letting me share my testimony with you all. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I am Alfredo Luna. I am a grateful believer in Jesus Christ. I struggle with alcoholism, hurts, and bad habits. I am from Phoenix, Arizona. I am the youngest of nine children in our family. Our father abandoned us when I was two weeks old, leaving my mother to raise, all, raise us all by herself. We attended church every Sunday, but didn't know the true meaning of being a follower of God. When I was nine years old, I took my first drink of alcohol, thinking this was the way of life. Later in my teen years, I started smoking marijuana and drinking became a regular thing every weekend. There was also a lot of violence in our home, which for a young child was a scary experience. My life before Jesus Christ was one of misery, heartache, pain, and destruction. Because of the loss of family members who are close and dear to me, I was angry at God for allowing these deaths to occur. I didn't want to live anymore without, without these loved ones being in my life. So I started drinking excessively without no care for, for myself or anyone else. I was uh, stealing to feed my addiction, drinking at work, deceiving everyone around me. But little did I know I was only deceiving myself. The turning point in my life was being found in an alley by my knees. I had swallowed a large amount of pills while intoxicated on vodka. I was attempting to end my life, although a blessing occurred about a week before I was found in that alley. I had put an application for residency, talked to an intake worker at the Lighthouse Sober Living Facility. Her name was Amber. She told me great things about the Lighthouse and its ministry. Right after a few days of being in a mental institution because of my suicide attempt, I was accepted in the lighthouse. This truly was no coincidence. Jesus was showing me how much he loves me and cares for me. At the lighthouse, I gave my life to Christ because I realized that I couldn't go on living my life without him. And I couldn't save myself on my own. In the past, I tried and never succeeded. I started attending AA meetings, but wasn't comfortable with calling myself a alcoholic every day. It just didn't seem right. Not bashing AA, it works for some, but it wasn't for me. 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells us, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. NIV translation. I started attending Celebrate Recover, I was welcomed with open arms and compassionate hearts. It was, it had, 
it has been a major impact in my life. I've made wonderful friends, and more importantly, I now have a, a wonderful family in Christ here at Celebrate Recovery. It has strengthened my foundation in Christ in my recovery. The love and support I have experienced here is more than a blessing and a gift. I'm so grateful to my Heavenly Father for this ministry and for City Park Church for letting us gather here. I will have one year of sobriety, June 26th of this year. But more importantly, thank you. Amen. Thank you. But more importantly, a meaningful and loving relationship with Jesus Christ. I have a great future walking hand in hand with Jesus. I have learned to love him, myself, and my life, to love and appreciate and be grateful for my loved ones who are still here with me. With the grace of God, I pray to fulfill the plan and purpose he created me for. Now I am in leadership training at Celebrate Recovery. I am honored to share the gospel of Jesus help and encourage others who are willing to change their lives, who have a sincere desire to become sober and or clean, to share all the wonderful, miraculous works and gifts God has done for me and blessed me with. To God be all the glory. Thank you for letting me share, share with you all. God bless you. We serve a mighty God, do we not? We serve a God who is loving, and kind, and compassionate. He seeks us out. He sees our brokenness. He sees our hurt. He sees all the things that all of us are going through. And praise God that he is the kind of God who doesn't run away from those things, but he runs toward those things. Thank you for, for sharing your stories, and thank you everybody else for being here. Uh, this morning to support. Um, I, I'm super grateful for Lynn. I'm super grateful for uh, all that she's done and how she's led this ministry. Um, she sat down in my office, I guess, two years ago or a little before two years ago when everything was like really, really hard at this church at that time. And she basically said, can I start a celebrate recovery? And honestly, my answer was whatever. I, I'm just like I, like, I got enough to worry about right now. And I'm so grateful that I didn't say no or let's wait or not now or anything like that. And I'm so grateful for you and for your ministry here at City Park Church. So um, can we stand and prepare to worship and, and, and sing to and celebrate and give honor and praise to the God that, that transforms and heals and, and rescues? Let's sing.